I'm Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations. Today, I'm going to have a conversation about the novel, The Moon is Down, by John Steinbeck. And I'm joined in my conversation by our Novel Conversations readers, Scott and Ildi Rich. Scott, Ildi, hello. Great to be here, Frank. Thanks for having me back. Always glad to have both of you here. Before we get started, let me read a brief introduction to our novel today, The Moon is Down. Written by John Steinbeck and published in 1942, The Moon is Down is the story of a military occupation of a small, unnamed town by soldiers of a large, unnamed nation. The soldiers are there to organize and control production at the local coal mine. But the occupiers soon find themselves in conflict with the townspeople as shock is replaced by a growing anger, and then anger is replaced by a growing resistance. As random acts of sabotage occur against soldiers and the coal mine, the invaders, under orders from above, impose repressive measures to keep the production going. Soon the occupiers feel isolated and surrounded by hate. As the coal production grinds to a halt and several of the invaders are murdered, they begin to realize that their hopes to be accepted as good men bringing a glorious new order have failed. With that introduction, Scott, let me ask you, is this the first time you read The Moon is Down? This is the first time for The Moon is Down. What did you think of it? It is a fantastic story to read when you're studying World War II. In just a few pages, it really is a complete story of men at war. Absolutely. Especially men who are coached in one ideology and discover reality is very different. Scott, we never know when this is happening. We never know where this is happening. Well, you know, the invaders are German. Some of the officers that are sent to occupy this small town mention having served in a recent war in the trenches of France. And so that leaves very few possibilities, if no other possibility. Well, Scott, since you've made an assumption about who our large unnamed nation is, do you also have an assumption about where our small town is? The small town is somewhere along the west coast of Norway. So it's your belief that this novel represents the occupation of a small Norwegian town by the Nazis, let's say right at the beginning of World War II. I'm certain of this. All right. Well, I appreciate your certitude. Ildi, let me ask you about this novel. Is this the first time you read John Steinbeck's The Moon is Down? It is the first time I read it, and I have to comment that all of what Scott was saying, he had to explain to me after the first chapter because I was completely lost. (laughs) When I go into a novel, I always like knowing where it's set, who the bad guys are, who the good guys are, or at least who the opposing forces are. Well, let me ask you, did having Scott put it into context for you change the way you read the rest of the novel? Yes and no. Having the context put things in perspective for me so I knew, you know, it's the Nazis and when they talked about the leader, I can envision Hitler. But I believe that Steinbeck left it ambiguous because the novel can be applied to any country at war and their occupiers. Right. Applicable to all people at all times. I think you're absolutely right, Ildi. And with that, I think we'll start our conversation the way John Steinbeck starts his novel, with a war. Scott? And the war is over about that quickly. Let me read that first sentence. Actually, there's two sentences. By 1045, it was all over. Sentence one. The town was occupied, the defenders defeated, and the war was finished. But Scott, it really wasn't finished. Well, yes, you've occupied the territory. You are in political control. There are no longer any standing forces opposing you. Now you have to sit down to governing. Well, tell us about that. Who invaded who? Who's in charge and what's going on? The invaders have sacked the town. But more than that, have sacked the entire nation. Nobody knows anything. All communication is completely kaput. Right. So when you say they've sacked the entire nation, our townspeople don't know that in this novel. One of the things they keep asking, well, did anyone resist? Is this going on everywhere? Is every town just like this? Is it just us? And it's not. We soon find out the entire country has been sacked. Well, let's get back to our particular town. Of course, we don't know the name of our town. And as we've said, we don't know the name of our invading force. But Ildi, who's in charge? The invaders are led by Colonel Lancer and a few of his men, and they have taken over the town and have set up their governing headquarters in the palace of the mayor of this town. Right. It's called a palace, but let's be clear, it's described as a five-room house. Right. (laughs) And as you said, Colonel Lancer, with some of his officers, a couple lieutenants, a couple captains, take over the mayor's house. Scott, tell me, who is the mayor? We simply know him as Mayor Orden. Mayor Orden and his wife, who tend to bicker just a little bit, and he is rarely without his closest friend since high school, Dr. Winter. That's right. Dr. Winter is sort of the unofficial vice mayor, let's say. Yeah, the only member of the unofficial cabinet. 
Well, let's not forget the mayor's wife, though. She's definitely in that cabinet. <laughs> she is. In fact, the beginning of the story is kind of riddled with these small details of everyday life. Some might call it nagging. <laughs> so we catch the mayor's wife and the mayor getting ready to receive Colonel Lancer after the town has been sacked. And she's fussing about his clothes. She's fussing about his ear hairs and his nose hairs and his eyebrow hairs. And the mayor is constantly trying to brush her away because he likes things the way they are. That's right. Here's a mayor of a town that's just been occupied by a small army. He's now got to go meet the leader of this occupying force. And all his wife is concerned about is his grooming. Right. But besides the mayor and Colonel Lancer, we're also quickly told about one other gentleman from the town, a Mr. Carell. Mr. Carell, as the novel states, was the popular storekeeper. And he just happened to have, quote, donated lunch, targets, cartridges, and prizes for a shooting competition to take place six miles back in the hills in a lovely glade Mr. Carell owned. All the local troops were there at their target practice as the invasion took place. And we're also told that the local postman and policeman were both away fishing on Mr. Carell's boat when this all happened as well. Interesting. (laughs) Not very interesting. It's clear from page one that Carell is a traitor. Spy. That's right. He's both. By the time Colonel Lancer and his men get to this small town, they know everything about it. They know who's in charge. They know where all the weapons have been held. They know where the soldiers are. They know how many soldiers there are, all because Mr. Carell had passed on the information. He was very good at the spying he was doing. Well, Scott Ildy, we'll talk a little bit more about George Carell in a couple minutes, but right now I want to get to the meeting between the mayor and Colonel Lancer. Well, Colonel Lancer is going to inform the mayor they do not really want any of the political structure to change. They want him to continue living in the mayor's palace, continue operating as the mayor, passing legal judgments as necessary. They do not want any unnecessary changes to take place whatsoever. All they want to do is ensure and increase the production from the coal mine for the war effort. Correct. And as long as that happens, everything else can remain status quo in this town. Well, status quo as in the mayor will be the puppet mayor and the judgments really will be passed down by Colonel Lancer and the opposing forces. But at the same time, they do appear to sincerely hope everyone's just going to go along with this. We're not going to interfere in their lives. They're going to keep doing their jobs. We're just going to direct the shipment somewhere else. Nothing at all must change as long as you cooperate. It really is extremely detached from emotion. But Scott, quickly we find one man who expects a lot of changes to happen in this town and who's not logical at all. He's extremely emotional. Very opportunistic as well. That's right. Back to our spy, George Carell. The storekeeper had much bigger plans than the invaders had. What were his plans? We'll overthrow the local authorities, and I can become the local authority. (laughs) Ah, so now we get to some of the motivation for Carell. He became a spy for the occupying force because he expects to be put into power. Yes, he wants to be a victor getting the spoils. And Ildi, is that what Colonel Lancer does? No, Colonel Lancer sees if the people saw Carell become mayor after he had just spied and had six of their soldiers killed during the invasion, they're not going to be all too happy with Carell and will inevitably mutiny against him. And isn't that really the ultimate fate of all spies? Once you've spied for one side, how can you ever be trusted by the other side when they know you spied for the other guys? Once a rat, always Always a rat. And Colonel Lancer knows that for a fact, and he gives nothing back to George Carell. Right. He even warns him, you should leave town. You're not going to live another month, and I cannot protect you. Carell doesn't believe him. Right. Carell actually sends a report back to the occupying leaders in hopes that they will go over the head of Colonel Lancer and promote him to mayor. (laughs) And Lancer expects even this. Lancer says, go ahead, do what you have to do, but I'm still advising you, you should get out soon. Right. It's funny, where Carell is an utterly true believer in the cause, Colonel Lancer is an ultimate realist and says, these are my orders, these are what I must do. He always knows what's going to happen because he has greater insight into human nature. Plus experience of a soldier. Experience of a previous war as well. That's right. All right, well, if we know that Mayor Orden is going to remain the mayor, is he going to do the bidding of the occupiers? 
you really don't know at first. And he says, I don't know what the people will do. I'll have to do what the people want. Right now, during our novel, we're one day into this occupation. So as with the mayor, the people are still in shock. They don't know what they want. They don't know what they want to do yet. And Mayor Orden is really acting like a true civil servant. And actually, Ildi, we don't have to wait too long to find out how some of the people react. A couple of them start reacting immediately. For instance, the mayor's cook, Annie. Right. Annie does not like the fact that there are soldiers at her back door. And she causes a little trouble by throwing some hot water on one of the soldiers. Boiling water. Yes. She has a bit of a temper. (laughs) And water's not her only weapon, is it? No. No. Steinbeck wrote, From the doorway came the sound of an angry woman's voice, and a thump, and a man's cry. Lancer asked, Was anyone hurt? Yes, sir. Scalded, and one man bitten. We are holding her, sir. (laughs) (laughs) We like Annie, don't we? Yes, very much so. (laughs) Annie's hilarious. All right, Scott, as our novel progresses, both the occupiers and the occupied settle down a little bit, trying to figure out how they should react to each other. And it's at this point in the novel that we meet some of the officers, starting with Major Hunter. Major Hunter is an engineer. He is considered an arithmetician instead of a mathematician. And Steinbeck says he has none of the humor, the music, or the mysticism of higher mathematics, that he's purely a numbers guy, adding and subtracting, multiplying and dividing. He even treats men that way. I like Steinbeck's quote about Major Hunter where he says, He'd been married several times, and he did not know why his wives became very nervous before they left him. (laughs) All right, once we meet Major Hunter, we meet a couple of the captains, Captain Bentick and Captain Loft. Tell me a little bit about Captain Bentick, Scott. I like Bentick right off, actually. He's described as a family man, a lover of dogs and pink children, and Christmas. He loves all things British. That's right. He describes himself as a Anglophile. Yes, and he spends a lot of his free time arguing about, quote, the relative merits of English and Gordon setters. (laughs) Clearly too much time on his hands. (laughs) He likes to wear English clothes, smoke English pipes with English tobacco. Mixed up special just for him, sent to him from London. That's right. And what about Captain Loft, Ildi? Well, Steinbeck says that Captain Bentick, who Scott just described, was too old to be a captain, and Captain Loft was too young. Now, Captain Loft was a soldier's soldier. He lived, breathed everything for the letter of the law. I mean, he memorized all the laws and knew them inside out and backwards. And he would quote it to you if you were even the slightest bit off in one of your procedures. That's right. He even made his superior officers nervous because, as you said, he knew the manual forwards and backwards. And he would call his superiors on it when they misinterpreted it. Right. He's like one of those annoying guys in school who gets a 99 on their test and argues about that one point they missed. (laughs) And Scott, the last two officers we meet are both the young lieutenants, Lieutenant Prackle and Lieutenant Tonder. Steinbeck says they were snot noses trained in the politics of the day, believing the great new system invented by genius so great that they never bothered to verify its results. I like to think of them as Tweedledee and Tweedledum. (laughs) They just kind of follow along whatever they're told. And they've clearly been told that they're going to go and sack this town and people will be laying the palm branches down in front of them and they're going to just embrace them for having conquered them. They serve as great counterparts to the wisdom and cynicism of our Colonel Lancer. Right. Colonel Lancer has experience and memories that make him wiser and more experienced. And these guys are fresh out of military school and are very impressionable and have no memories as of yet. In fact, Colonel Lancer almost despairs for his young lieutenants. He fears that the reality of war will shatter their idealisms. And he's right. It will. There's a very interesting paragraph on Lancer. It says, Lancer tried not to think what he knew, that war's treachery and hatred, the muddling of incompetent generals, the torture and killing and sickness and tiredness, until at last it is over, and nothing is changed except for new weariness and new hatreds. And towards the end of the paragraph, this one will be different, he said to himself, 50 times a day. This one will be very different. He has to tell himself 50 times a day, so maybe he'll believe it. And that apparently is not enough. All right, Scott Ildi, now that we've met most of the officers and the process of the army settling into this town has begun, both the colonel and the mayor are still not really sure how the people are going to react to this occupation. And then George Carell comes into a meeting with the colonel with a bandage on his head, and both the colonel and the mayor think they may have started to get their answer. 
Right. And the colonel says, have they tried to kill you already? And Carell is very naive and says that these are different people and that they're very trusting. They're my friends. I don't need a bodyguard. These people like me. But clearly, as readers, we know that the colonel and the mayor now realize they're hearing from the people and the people are not happy. Right. Carell says that a stone fell from a cliff in the morning and that's how he got the wound on his head. And Colonel Lancer sees through that and asks him, are you sure it wasn't thrown? It's incredible how oblivious Carell is to what he has done to these people. Lancer goes on to say to Carell, if you are safe, these people are different from any in the world. And he even asks him a question, did anyone buy anything in your store this morning? Just absolutely oblivious. Lancer has seen this process before. Right, and he advises Carell to wear a helmet, keep indoors, do not go out at night, and above all, do not drink. Well, Scott, if Carell getting wounded was an indication to Lancer and Mayor Orden that the people were starting to get a little angry, what happens next to Captain Bentick absolutely confirms it. Absolutely. While Carell is still meeting with Lancer, Captain Loft rushes into the room to make an official report that Captain Bentick has just been killed. It turns out that while changing the guard at the local coal mine and blurting out orders to one of the workers who resented his orders, this worker then rushed at the occupying commander and Captain Bentick got in the way and ended up punctured by a coal mining pick. And Scott, any idea that Colonel Lancer had had that this might be a different kind of occupation, a peaceful occupation, is completely shattered with his next thoughts. Yeah, Steinbeck wrote, Lancer stood up slowly and spoke as though to himself. So it starts again. We will shoot this man and make 20 new enemies. It's the only thing we know. And that man is one of the townspeople, Alexander Morden. And what's going to happen to Alexander Morden? He will be shot. Well, wait, Ildi. They're going to give him a trial first. A mock trial. And then they'll shoot him. And they're going to force Mayor Orden to be the judge administrator of this punishment. What does the mayor think about his new job? It's at this point that the mayor is going to put his foot down. He challenges Lancer and says, I cannot hand down this sentence to Alexander Morden. It is not justice. But Scott, what the mayor tells the colonel is, there's one way I will agree to condemn Alexander Morden to death, and that's if you condemn the soldiers to death that killed our town guard. That's right. If you're willing to execute them, I will hand down a sentence to have Mr. Morden executed. And what does the colonel think about this? You cannot be serious. This is impossible. And Orden says, yes, I know, but what you ask is also impossible. And then Lancer finally, in dismay, admits that he thinks maybe Carell has to be the mayor after all. It's amazing. I was really struck that Lancer really likes Orden. I think he has a lot of respect for him. I think they understand one another. And understand the bigger picture around them as well. And really, with the colonel's rejection of the mayor's, let's call it, compromise, Alexander Morden's fate is sealed. Absolutely. But before he's executed, the mayor talks to him and really sets up the rest of the novel for us. Orden says, When they came, the people were confused, and I was confused. We did not know what to do or think. Yours was the first clear act. Your private anger was the beginning of a public anger. And now we're going to see how the people unite against the occupiers. And really, that public anger manifests itself almost immediately after the execution of the coal miner. Scott? Steinbeck describes the clashing of many guns going off all at once and presume that that's the execution. The firing squad. That's the firing squad going off. And moments later, if not seconds later, you hear rocks coming through windows and one of the lieutenants comes running in to report that people are not taking well to this. In fact, Lieutenant Prackle has been shot in the shoulder and Lancer leaps up crying, so it starts. Right. Chapter 5 begins with this line, the days and the weeks dragged on and the months dragged on. The snow fell and melted and fell and melted and finally fell and stuck. Yes, in that same paragraph, Steinbeck writes, Machinery broke and took a long time to fix. The people of the conquered country settled in a slow, silent, waiting revenge. The cold hatred grew with the winter. Right. So what can you do when you have no arms against these people? The only thing you can do is do the slowdown. Sabotage. But it goes beyond sabotage and it goes beyond slowdown. As Steinbeck continues to write, The men of the battalion could sing only together and could dance only together and the dancing gradually stopped, 
and the singing expressed a longing for home. No man might relax his guard for even a moment. If he did, he disappeared. If he went alone to a woman, he disappeared, and some snowdrift received his body. If he drank, he disappeared, and a snowdrift received his body. So the occupiers are feeling it as much as the occupied. Very much feeling prisoners in this foreign land. And this is where you see the two faces of war. You understand and feel the pain of the occupied, and yet it is also starting to take a toll on the occupiers. In fact, Scott, some of the soldiers start to go crazy. Yes, Tondra in particular, as time drags on, you cannot trust anyone. You cannot spend a moment where you let your guard down. He becomes isolated and then very quickly becomes extremely lonely. Lonely for the company of women in particular, and, and not a lustful way. He just wants the attention of the opposite sex. And Ildi, it's Lieutenant Tonder that gives us one of the most memorable quotes in the novel. Yes, Tonder compares he and his compatriots to flies. He says, flies conquer the flypaper. Flies capture 200 miles of new flypaper. He says this because clearly, now that they've captured the flypaper, they're now stuck. It's become a quagmire, if you will. There is a new tone to Tonders. He has a note of hysteria creeping into his voice and into his laughter. He's so frustrated with no human interaction with these people. He was anticipating the people being happy that they captured him. Instead, he is encountering nothing but hatred. And it's Lieutenant Tonder's craving for some sort of human interaction that leads him to the house of Molly Morden, the widowed wife of Alexander Morden, the coal miner who had been executed a few months ago. Right. He doesn't know that she is his widow, however. All he knows is that she's an unattached woman who might give him some sort of human contact. Seems just to admire her from afar for weeks on end. She's quiet. She's lonely. I'm sure she would like to have company, too. And eventually he shows up at her home. Yes, and she suspects he's up to no good. And as a reader, isn't that what we suspect? Well, I'd never gotten the strain that he had a violent streak like that. Ildi, how about you? I didn't know quite what was going to happen when he came to her house. I didn't know whether he was going to become violent, whether she was going to become violent. I was very apprehensive going into this scene. But as the reader, you knew this cannot work out well. Well, then don't leave me in suspense. What does happen to Lieutenant Tonder when he meets Molly Morden? Molly asks him, are you forcing yourself on me? He says, no, not at all. I just want to talk to you. Well, and she's trying to get rid of him pretty quick because unbeknownst to the soldiers, the townspeople have an underground system to help certain people get out of the town. People that have committed acts of sabotage and that are on the hit list. That's right. There's actually supposed to be a clandestine meeting at Molly's house right now. So she's trying to repulse Tonder and get him to come back later, maybe. And at the same time, it's her first opportunity to get any sort of hurtful digs in on these occupying men who killed her husband. That's right, but it's important to remember what Ildi said. Molly wants him to go away and maybe come back later. Yes. But she needs to get him out of the house, and she needs to get him out of the house now. And sure enough, he leaves. And the meeting that she was expecting does occur. Who's at this meeting at her house? Well, Mayor Orden and his cook, Annie, have been smuggling people who have the need out of the country on boats to England. Particularly the young males. Right. And so on this particular evening, two brothers... The Anders brothers? The Anders brothers need to escape. And so the two brothers, Mayor Orden and Annie, are all meeting at the Morden household. Scott, are we told how the mayor and Annie plan on getting the Anders brothers out of town? Well, the Anders brothers have a plan. They're going to slip over to their old friend Krell the Spy's personal boat dock and take his personal boat all the way to England. And they're going to take Karel with them. But not necessarily all the way. Gotcha. But Ildi, before the brothers leave, Mayor Orden makes one request of them. Bonjour. This is Fabulously Delicious, the French food podcast. I'm Andrew Pryor. And every week, I bring you the wonderful and fabulous people involved in French food, whether they're here in France like me or from around the world. Each week, we dive into a specific topic, be it a French dish, an ingredient, or a French cuisine cooking technique. My guests are all about French food. So come join me on Fabulously Delicious, the French food podcast. Bon app. Mayor Orden asks the brothers that when they get to England, ask for weapons. And when they ask, well, what kind of weapons? Do you want guns? 
Orden says, no, we need simple secret weapons, weapons of stealth, like explosives and dynamite to blow up rails, grenades, and if possible, even poison. That's right. The mayor tells the brothers, this is no honorable war. This is a war of treachery and murder. Let us use the methods that have been used on us. Let the British bombers drop their big bombs on the works, but let them also drop little bombs to use, to hide, to slip under the rails, under tanks. Then we will be armed, secretly armed. Right. And he has no idea whether they're going to succeed, but if they can, then they'll do whatever they can to slowly undermine the occupiers. On another note, the brothers said, I've heard it said that in England there are still men in power who do not dare to put weapons in the hands of common people. Orden stared at him. Well, we can only see. If such people still govern England and America, the world is lost anyway. But Ildi, that's not the end of tonight's work, is it? No. Annie, who is the lookout, sees Tonder returning to the Morden house. And Molly gets rid of Annie, and as Steinbeck writes, she saw the big scissors lying beside her knitting. She picked them up wonderingly by the blades. Then she was holding them like a knife, and her eyes were horrified. Tonders knocks on the door, and she says, I'm coming, Lieutenant. And I think we know what happens next. But as readers, we don't know for a little while. Right. What is the next thing we know? The next thing we know, it's clear that the Anders brothers have made it to England because English bombers are now dropping packages to the townspeople. Packages filled with dynamite. And on a slightly funny note, the dynamite contains a small package of chocolate for the children to eat as a reward by finding the dynamite to take back to their parents. And actually, it was pretty clever of the British to use chocolate with these bombs, as Steinbeck writes, The word got to the children about the gift, and they combed the countryside in a terrible Easter egg hunt. And the soldiers scurried about the town in another Easter egg hunt, but they were not so good at it as the children. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what are the soldiers going to do about all these bombs parachuting in? Well, Loft says we should set booby traps and poison the chocolate. Yeah, and Lancer's seen that before, hasn't he? Lancer knows that they are not dealing with stupid people. He says, one man will pick up one of these booby trap packages and get blown to bits. One kid will eat chocolate and die of strychnine poisoning. And then what? Then the people will poke them with poles or lasso them before they touch them. Or they will try the chocolate on the cat. These are intelligent people, and stupid traps won't catch them twice. Well, Scott, what are the occupiers going to do? They're not going to booby trap the bombs. They're not going to poison the chocolate. What can they do? The order is made that they are to hold the local authorities, namely Mayor Orden, as a hostage. And if any more explosive devices are set off, he will be executed. And then somebody else will be held hostage. That's right. Lancer says, you know what the orders are going to be. Take the leaders, shoot the leaders. Take hostages, shoot the hostages. Take more hostages, shoot them too. And about as soon as they tell him that he'll be executed the next time something is exploded, something is exploded. They hear it in the distance, and you can almost see them rolling their eyes. So the reprisals have begun. That's right, Ildi, they have begun. But before anyone is arrested and before anyone is shot, there was still one more surprise for our occupiers and for the occupied. What was that surprise? Lo and behold, Corral the spy is not yet dead. No, wait a minute. I thought the Anders brothers took him in his boat and dumped him in the ocean on their way to England. As Corell described it, they tried to waylay him, but the patrol saved him. And actually, Corell comes to Colonel Lancer with some pretty interesting information about Lieutenant Tonders. Right. Corell comes to Colonel Lancer with a black notebook from his pocket, and he opens it, and he says he has not stopped spying, and he has a lot of information for him. He reports that Mayor Orden has been in constant contact with every happening in the community. And he tells Lancer that Tonder was murdered by Molly Morden and that the girl escaped to the hills and she stayed with one of Orden's relatives. And Carell also suspects Orden of being somehow involved with the little parachute packages of dynamite. He's a decent spy after all. (laughs) Just a terrible neighbor. (laughs) Well, Scott, what does Colonel Lancer do with this new information about the mayor? Lancer doesn't believe it, but at this point, Carell did, in fact, go over the head of Colonel Lancer, and he has received some decision-making authority in the town. It's more than decision-making authority. He is the supreme civilian authority in this town now. Yes, and that means that Orden is going to go. That's right. And after him, all the other leaders in the town. But Ildi, before the mayor is executed, he has some great words for his townspeople. 
Yes, Lancer wants Orden to come out and tell the people not to fight, to plead for his life. And Orden is not going to do it. He says he has no choice about dying, but he does have a choice on how to do it. He says, if I tell them not to fight, they will be sorry, but they'll fight anyway. If I tell them to fight, they'll be glad. And I, who am not a very brave man, will have made them a little braver. And he smiles and says, you see, it's an easy thing to do since the end is the same for me. And Scott Ildi, essentially, that's how our novel, The Moon is Down by John Steinbeck, ends. We don't know the fate of this town, but we know they will keep fighting. Right. Absolutely. Now, of course, Ildi Scott, we didn't have a chance to get to every character or every moment in this novel. So if you have a quote that you want to read or a character you want to introduce us to, now's your opportunity. Scott, do you have something? I have a couple of things on the same theme. Two different quotes, both from Mayor Orden. And it would seem they're a little bit contradictory at first, but they're really just two sides of the same thought. Halfway through the book, Orden says, in regards to the fighting between the occupiers and the occupied, quote, it's people against people, not idea against idea. Essentially that this is personal. It's not just some sort of scientific procedure. And at the very end, end of the book, Orden says the other part, which is getting to the heart of the ideas underlying all of this. They can't arrest the mayor. The mayor is an idea conceived by free men. It will escape arrest. In other words, you cannot harm people and think it doesn't bother them. And the second part is you cannot imprison ideas. They will live. Orden really grasps the underlying motivations of these people. And the occupiers. I agree. One of my favorite scenes is when Lancer is getting sick and tired of hearing all of his officers be ignorant of war and their understanding of it. And he gives this little scene that he remembers. And he says, I'm tired of people who have not been at war who know all about it. I remember a little old woman in Brussels, sweet face, white hair. She was only four feet 11, delicate old hands. You could see the veins almost black against her skin. She used to sing our national songs to us in the quivering voice. She always knew where to find a cigarette or a virgin. We didn't know her son had been executed. When we finally shot her, she had killed 12 men with a long black hat pin. I have it yet at home. I remember that quote. That was a very impactful quote. And I thought of this during the scene with Molly Morden. She is like that little old woman. She's going to act all nice and sweet and take down as many men as she can take. Revenge seems to be one of the most common currents in all wars. And I think the fact that Lancer told us about that moment shows us that he knows how this battle is going to end as well. I think he understands and almost condones these actions. And at the same time, knows he cannot stop it. He can only do as ordered. Right. Which is sad. Very sad. And actually, what both of you have just said really fits well with the last quote that I want to read. And this is from Mayor Orden again. Free men cannot start a war. But once it is started, they can fight on in defeat. Herd men, followers of a leader, cannot do that. And so it is always the herdsmen who will win the battles, but it's always the free men who win the wars. I hope that's true for these townspeople. For free men everywhere. And that's where we'll end today's conversation about the novel, The Moon is Down, by John Steinbeck. Ildi Scott, I want to thank you both for coming in and having this conversation with me today. It was very enlightening. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure as well. Thank you again. Joining me now for EndNotes on today's conversation is our researcher, Ted Schwartz. Hello, Ted. Hi, Frank. Ted, of course we all know that John Steinbeck was the author of our novel, but is it true that Uncle Sam was his editor? In part. What happened was in October of 1941, Steinbeck and a group of writers were called to Washington to meet with an organization entitled the Foreign Information Service. And Ted, the FIS was a unit of the OSS, the forerunner of today's CIA. Yes. Now, Steinbeck, prior to this, had been interviewing German refugees, people who had been in occupied territories. As a journalist, he was absolutely fascinated by this. And when given the assignment to write some form of propaganda in the minds of how it was to be used, not in Steinbeck's mind, he said, it seemed to me that if I could write the experiences of the occupied, such an account might even be a blueprint setting forth what might be expected and what could be done about it. So from that idea, He decided to create a story about what happens when a U.S. unnamed city is occupied by a foreign power. That book would be called The New Order. 
Well, Ted, of course, our novel is called The Moon is Down, and the town in that novel is clearly not an American town. It's an unnamed Scandinavian town. How did that change come about? The United States was in crisis by the time Steinbeck changed the book. Pearl Harbor had occurred. There was a very real thought that the United States could be occupied, and it was felt this would be totally demoralizing. So he was asked to change the location of this. And we believe that he was asked by the Foreign Information Service. No, we know he was asked by his editor at Viking. Who may have been asked by the Foreign Information Service. He probably was. Okay. Well, Ted, let me ask you, when the novel was released in March of 1942, did it have the impact that Steinbeck and the FIS wanted it to? No one could anticipate the impact that that novel had. Well, tell me a little bit more about it. It comes out in English. Where it was published in Europe is unknown. Somehow it made its way into some of these occupied towns, possibly relatives of those he had interviewed. They translated it from language to language to language. This was not done by any organization. 20 different languages. Within just a couple of years. Within a few months. Ah. Huh? At the same time, a man named Winston Churchill. I think I've heard that name. He read the book and he thought, my God, our methods are terrible. We're dropping every kind of heavy duty ordinance. Steinbeck's right what these people were saying. So he ordered the creation of weapons that could be dropped, that could be hidden, that had never been used before. Instead of dynamite, for example, he had a special device about the size of a card. You tore off a piece of paper on it, and then when you set it, about 30 minutes later, it would be an incendiary device giving off 2,000 degrees of heat for four minutes. Those clever Brits. He also created a special handgun that had one bullet that would fire, but the handle carried other bullets. That was made by General Electric Company in the United States, but dropped by the British. That's amazing. A novel that John Steinbeck wrote to be basically a study of the psyche of occupiers and the occupied. A novel that the FIS wanted so that maybe it could be used as propaganda ends up inspiring Winston Churchill to fight a war in a completely different style, almost what we would call today a guerrilla style. Well, he didn't fight the war that way. He still had traditional warfare. But you had so many of these little towns that were occupied that people wanted to get rid of their occupiers, would do whatever it took, but had no weapons. This gave them small, concealable, very deadly weapons. So they were actually creating other fronts, very much like enslaved workers in other countries during the war when they would sabotage whatever project they were on. Ted, it really is fascinating when you consider the reverberations that have come from a small but great novel like this. And that was always Steinbeck's genius, mixing journalism with fiction. Boy, he sure got it right in this one. Ted, thank you very much for bringing this background information about today's novel, The Moon is Down by John Steinbeck. You're welcome, Frank. I also want to thank our Novel Conversations readers, Ildi and Scott Rich. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next week, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. Novel Conversations is a production of the Front Porch People. Listen to more great conversations at thefrontporchpeople.com. Thank you for listening. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not, it's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.